Hi, this is Hydrosynth from ASM, part of Medeli, a big instrument manufacturer from China. You can see it's ribbon controller, obviously. But what you can't see is that it has a keyboard with polyphonic aftertouch, as well as a built-in rather powerful synth. It also comes in a desktop version. And a pretty original and innovative interface to get to all its features. Let's take an in-depth look at everything it can do. Both hydrosynths are fully digital 8-voice synths with virtual analog FM and wavetable oscillators, three of them, two filters with multiple filter style emulations, five envelopes and five LFOs per voice, and an extensive effects section. They come in desktop and keyboard versions, and while you shouldn't discount the synth features, one of the unique features in both, but certainly in the keyboard version, is a keyboard which isn't only velocity sensitive, but also has polyphonic aftertouch, as well as a large ribbon controller. The pads in the desktop version are also velocity sensitive with polyphonic aftertouch, more on that later. Before we get into the details of the keybed and synth features, let's take a look at the hardware overall. Both the desktop and the keyboard versions have an extremely solid build. They're both made of steel and are of the heavier instruments I've lifted compared to their size. The keyboard weighs 22 pounds or 10 kilos and the desktop is 8 pounds or about 3.5 kilos. The knobs and switches feel solid. The two displays are crisp OLED and clearly visible from any angle. Both have expression and sustain pedal inputs in the back, MIDI in, out and through and over USB and quarter inch left and right outputs as well as a quarter inch stereo headphone output. I'll dive into the differences between the two later, but again, sticking to a bird's eye view, Hydrosynth is obviously not a knob per function synth, but the way they've implemented control over the various sections of the synth is actually quite smart and original. The module select section in both synths lays out the signal path really nicely. So it's very clear that these are the oscillators, these are the filters, and these are the effects, envelopes, and LFOs. It's pretty easy to just follow the signal chain and figure out where you are. To edit the parameters of a specific module, you just press it. So let's say I want to edit the parameters of the reverb effect. I just press it, they appear here in two rows, and each of these knobs controls the parameters for that specific module. So if I wanted to edit you know, the dry wet of the reverb, that's how I do that, or the reverb time. Right. Simple as that. The screen has a nice scope on it when you aren't editing any parameters. And say if I go into the oscillator module, it'll show you a preview of what I'm changing the oscillator to. Same goes for the filter types. I press the filter module and then get a nice visualization of what's going on as I say, change the cutoff or add resonance, right, or change the filter type. And there's also a vowel filter. And the vowel filter also has this funky animation. Now a module may have more than eight parameters, in which case the arrow is a little bit brighter over here. You press it and you can page down to the next page of parameters or page back up. There are really handy lights around each knob so you can tell what the parameter position is. And of course they adjust as you page through the parameters and the modules. Finally, there's a really nice form of feedback in the LFO and envelope lights. You can see them grow dimmer or brighter as the LFOs move through their waveform. Same goes for the envelopes. As the different envelopes move through their phases, that's reflected nicely in the lights. Another reason the module selection layout is super helpful is when creating modulation connections. I mean, you could go into the mod matrix and create those one by one, but if you want to connect, say, an LFO to an oscillator, you just hit the LFO, press the oscillator, and you can set the mod depth and you're good to go. 
Finally, in terms of overview, when you exit a specific module by hitting the home button, then these eight knobs become macro controls for the preset. These are pretty nicely defined in all the factory presets. And of course, you can create your own macros. Each macro knob can control up to eight parameters across the synth. Okay, so let's take a look at the differences between the desktop and keyboard version. Now, obviously size and input mechanisms are different. The keyboard version has polyphonic aftertouch and the ribbon controller with pitch bend, mod wheel, and even a theremin mode. While the desktop version doesn't have pitch bend or mod wheel controls, each of its 24 RGB pads respond to velocity and have polyphonic aftertouch or pressure response. They let you play in some cases between three to four and even more octaves. More on this when we talk about the pads. Aside from the obvious controls, you have a few additional knobs on the keyboard that you don't on the desktop. For example, there are only three filter control knobs for both filter one or filter two on the desktop. The keyboard version has five control knobs, the same three as on the desktop and two additional ones for envelope mod depth and LFO one mod depth. The keyboard also has eight arpeggiator control knobs compared to only four on the desktop version. But just to make it clear, the parameters that these access are all available on the desktop version as well. You just don't have dedicated controls for them. So the synth engine is completely identical between these two. Also the filter and arpeggiator knobs are slightly bigger and the master control section slightly more spaced out on the keyboard version. So things definitely feel more roomy on the keyboard, but everything's accessible on the desktop and certainly the desktop is more portable. Additional features on the keyboard version are pitch and mod wheels, a glide and chord mode, which I'll get into later that doesn't exist on the desktop, dedicated octave up and down buttons, which are shift functions on the desktop, and not only a quarter inch headphone output, but also an eighth inch or 3.5 millimeter output, as well as volume control for the headphones. The desktop version, on the other hand, is rack mountable. It comes with ears included in the package. It's smaller and lighter, and the pads, like I mentioned before, can be configured to different scales, so you can control three and up to four octaves with these 24 pads in a relatively small form factor. The connection jacks in the back of the desktop version are recessed which can be looked at as a pro or as a con. It gives you more room for longer connectors, but when it's sitting on your desk, you have to reach in quite a bit to get to the on off switch and the jacks. Okay, so let's take a look at the keybed and polyphonic aftertouch implementation. The keybed itself is a synth style keyboard with quick action and feels excellent with enough travel. Velocity response works as you would expect. Hit it lightly and the sound is quiet and hit harder. Right, it goes through the range quite nicely. But of course, what you might care more about is how poly aftertouch works. Okay, so to show you how this works, I created a simple preset. That's just a sine wave. Now, polyphonic aftertouch is really just a modulation source. So I'll go into the mod matrix, go to an empty slot, and then pick polyphonic aftertouch, here you go, polyphonic aftertouch as a mod source, and then pick a mod destination. In this case, I'll go for oscillator one and pitch is fine. And then let's set the mod depth to as deep as possible. So aftertouch is when you hit a key and then press it down, right? You get modulation in this case of pitch, but you can assign it to any parameter you want. Polyphonic aftertouch is when you have individual aftertouch control on a per key basis. So if I hit these two keys and then press this one harder or this one harder, they'll move separately. And being polyphonic means it works across the keyboard, right? So if I hit four keys, I should be able to control every note individually. So yeah, it works quite nicely. On the black keys too, by the way. So yeah, polyphonic aftertouch in a relatively affordable synth. Let's talk about the ribbon. The ribbon has three modes. If I hit the ribbon button, I can configure them. It has a theremin mode, pitch bend mode, and mod only mode. Let's start with pitch bend. So the way this works is quite simple. It takes the position you touch the ribbon and modulates pitch from there. So if I press it here, I have all this range to pitch bend up and then 
this to pitch bend down mod mode it basically works like a uh, like a mod wheel and of course the interesting mode is theremin mode so you could set it to either quantize or not All right, so this is unquantized you can set the key span range by the way so only two octaves two up to six octaves and of course if you quantize it it sticks to a scale and you can configure that scale over here to any one of quite a large number of scales, even a custom scale, if you like. Now, when you activate the theremin, it gets its own voice. So it doesn't interfere or steal voices from anything else you have going on, which is really cool. Unfortunately, it doesn't get its own timbre. Wouldn't that be nice to be able to assign a preset to the theremin that would be different from what you're playing on the keyboard. While we're on the topic of features specific to the keyboard version of Hydrosynth, the chord button lets you play chords with one note. And you define the chord just by pressing the chord button and playing the chord you want. Now normally, this will just transpose the chord. I played a minor chord, so no matter where I go, the chord will be a minor chord, but if I hit the voice function and then go into scale, then I can adjust that to a major scale or to, again, any number of scales in here. So that's what's special about the keyboard version. Let's move on to the desktop version to see what's unique about it, as well as on for the rest of the review because it's a little bit easier to fit in the frame. All right, so let's zoom in to the desktop version of Hydrosynth and talk a bit about the RGB pads. They are both velocity and pressure sensitive. So you can play each note with emphasis on whatever you want. The default layout of the RGB pads is chromatic, right? So semitone intervals, and you can pitch it down or up using the octave buttons. So all the way down here, and then up. And there are three other pad modes which you change by holding shift and pressing pad mode up or pad mode down. By default, you see fretboard layout and octave layout. This is as long as you're in the chromatic mode. Fretboard layout is sort of like a guitar or bass guitar arrangement. In this layout, every line is a fourth above the one below it, so any shapes you learned while practicing guitar are applicable. Next up is octave mode, which is as the name implies, right? All the semitones in the octave as long as you're in chromatic mode. But if you move a scale into one of the scales that you have shortcuts here, let's say choose the minor scale, right? Then octave mode looks like this. So these are only the notes in the minor scale. And then a subset of this mode is octave row where each row represents an octave. If you want, you can also set the key and use this sort of keyboard shape to determine that. Okay, so let's take a look at the synth in Hydrosynth. Now I'll be using the desktop, like I said before, it fits better in the frame, but everything in the synth engine is applicable to the keyboard version as well. Now, as you saw before, the entire synth engine is really nicely laid out in the module select section. Let's start with the oscillators. So on the tone generation side, Hydrosynth has three oscillator modules with two mutant modules for each of the first two oscillators, and then an additional ring noise module, all of them feeding into the mixer. The two first oscillators have slightly more advanced features than oscillator three. All three let you choose over 200 different waveforms. That's called single mode, and then oscillators one and two also have a wavetable mode, or wave scan, which let you choose up to eight waveforms and then morph between them. Let's take a listen to the basic wave shapes first. Obviously there are 200 of them, or over 200 of them, so we won't go through all of them, but saw sounds like this. Right, so quite nice and beefy. There's a square right over here. 
and there's pulse width modulation for this. We'll get to this later. There are various pulse width waveforms. All of these modulatable in the mutant modules. We'll get to that, of course. And then it gets into, you know, wavetable category. Like I said, we can't go through all of these. But quite a few rich textures here. Now in wave scan mode, you can choose eight of any one of these over 200 waveforms, put them in a wave list, and then morph between them. So you edit the wave list here. You can see I've got saw in this one. I could just go ahead and choose whatever I wanted for uh, this one. Let's go all the way here initially, and then to this one, and then morph uh, to this guy, why not, and so on. And then if I go back, the wave scan parameter morphs through those waveforms. Now you may have noticed as I was going through these waveforms that some of them live in families, you know, horizon one, two, three, four, five, and so on. If I wanted to populate this quickly with a family of waveforms, I could just press shift. And then when I scroll through the waveforms, they will all automatically populate based on the initial waveform that I choose here. So now I could morph through this entire family of sounds. Right, so this is an option. You don't have to use it, but you can if you want. There are a few other oscillator features like tuning. You can tune three octaves up and down, each of the three oscillators, including sense if you want. All right, there's key tracking, and that's pretty much what you need to know about the three oscillator modules. Let's go back to a basic shape. Next up in the signal chain are the mutant modules, and what they do, as their name implies, is mutate whatever comes before them. They have a few modes, linear FM, wave stack, oscillator sync, a few pulse width modulation options, and a harmonic option. Let's go through these briefly. For linear FM, I will choose a sine wave oscillator, and then, right, quite simply, you've got dry wet for FM, ratio control, right, feedback. So, very simple and nice modulator to carrier linear FM. In linear FM mode, you've got a bunch of sources, not just sine wave, right? So if you wanted to take any other waveforms or any of the oscillators or the mutants or the mod inputs, you can use all of those for linear FM. Next up is wave stack. What that does is simply layer five detuned copies of the original waveform onto itself. All right, so this is our sine wave. Might as well pick a different one. It'll be more noticeable. Let's go for saw, All right? So this is the dry signal. And then as we increase dry wet and depth, this happens. And this is applicable to all the waveforms, right? Not just saw, of course. So anything can be stacked in this mode. All right, so that's wave stack. Let's go to oscillator sync. So this will sync the current oscillator to whatever source I choose here. Right, let's choose oscillator two. I'll put oscillator two in any waveform. It doesn't matter. We're actually not going to be hearing oscillator two, only what it does to oscillator one. I'll choose a basic waveform you may be more used to hearing. Let's check out oscillator sync. That's that typical oscillator sync effect where oscillator one is being hard synced to oscillator two. Next up is pulse width modulation. For that, let's start with a square wave, go into mutant, choose PW original, which is the basic form of pulse width modulation here. And since there's dry wet, we'll put this 100% wet. And that's basic pulse width modulation. And of course you can modulate this with any of the LFOs. Now, this applies to any of the waveforms, right? So if I go in here and choose anything else, let's just go for this thing, right? So there's, this is what pulse width modulation does to other waveforms. Oops. Oh, there's ratio, of course, which does that. Right. The basic, I guess, is this. 
And there's pulse width modulation squeeze, which as you can see, sort of exponentially squeezes the waveform. Again, this can be applied to any of the waveforms in the database. Then there's pulse width ASM, which gives you wave shaping control over the waveform in eight separate segments. All right, so let's take a basic sine wave for this and start mutating it. We need to have depth on for this, then go into custom edit and we can change right, every one of the eight segments of the waveform to fold it onto itself. Right, and this happens and there's depth control for this. Right, feedback as well if you want it. So you can get very metallic and harsh here. And this is just a sine wave, right? Imagine what we could do to the other ones. And this is what ratio does. So that's PWASM. Then finally, there's harmonic, which we need something other than a sine wave to demo. Let's go for sawtooth. Now, I wanna turn off everything that I did here. You can actually init a module by hitting init and in it again, let's choose harmonic, right? So this is our core sawtooth waveform and it's harmonics. And as we turn up dry wet, you can see that this is sort of like a filter going out and picking out the different harmonics. This is what feedback does. And there's depth as well. all have very interesting harmonic impact on this waveform. Right, it's almost like two peaks moving around the waveform. All right, let's keep moving down the signal chain. The ring noise module is really two different modules put together, a ring modulator and a noise module. You have independent level control both here in the module and in the mixer. Noise is just three types of noise, right? So white, pink, and brown. And then for ring mod, you can take any two sources and apply ring mod to them. All right, so let's say oscillator one, uh, let's pick uh, just a regular old sine wave for that. Oscillator two, let's pick a sine wave just to keep it simple. All right, so this is a ring mod of two sine waves, very simple. But as we add more harmonics, let's just go crazy with a couple of these. Then obviously things can get pretty wild harmonically. So that's the ring mod. Let's move on to the mixer module. The mixer controls both levels and panning for each and every one of the sources, right? So if this is our little ring mod. We can choose to pan that left and right, but it goes way beyond that for each of the sources. You can also send it to either one of the two filters. Now we'll talk about these two filters in a bit, but let's just take down the cutoff, say of filter number one, right? And then I can choose to send the ring mod audio to either filter one, a combination of filter one and filter two, or just filter two, which is off now, but you get the idea that you can select a filter destination for all the oscillators, ring mod and noise, which is an excellent sound design tool, I think, because you can selectively filter any audio source or any tone generator. The mixer module is also where you choose whether the filters are routed in series, where filter one is fed into filter two, or in parallel, where audio goes through both of them in parallel. So let's talk about the filters. You probably wanna hear a sawtooth waveform into a low pass filter, so let's do that. I'll clear this preset. This is our good old sawtooth. You can control the cutoff either using this knob or by going into either of the filters and changing the cutoff parameter here. Now there are 11 filter types and 219 waveforms, so we're not gonna sweep through them all, but just for historic purposes, let's go through a sawtooth. Right, 12 dB per octave or two pole ladder filter. Let's add some resonance. Let's go full on. Let's try out the 24 
4 dB ladder filter. resonance yeah so I think these sound quite nice so this is a ladder filter emulation where the bass does drop as you bring up resonance there are also what they call fat 12 and fat 24 where the bass doesn't drop off as you increase resonance All right, so this is without resonance and then as we increase it, there is no drop in the bass. These self-oscillate, of course. Let's try lower frequencies. If you're hearing this on your phone, you probably can't hear anything, but hopefully... For those of you who want, you can hear this later on. Other filter types are a low pass gate type filter, and then MS20 style filter emulation. It's a slightly more aggressive. And there's a high pass mode for this as well. And there's this, which is another, I think, even more interesting type of filter. And this comes in low pass, band pass, and high pass flavors. And then there's the vowel filter. Right, where you can choose you can see the mouth is mouthing out the vowels. You can choose to change the order of the vowels if you want, right? So this is A-I-O-U, but should you want something else, you can do that as well. Filter 1 also has a drive function, which you can choose to have pre-filter, right? Or post-filter. So that's filter one. Filter two is a simple filter. It only has one mode which morphs between high pass, band pass, and low pass modes. So in high pass mode, right, it's a high pass filter. And then you can morph it through band pass to low pass with and without resonance. Right. So pretty nice additional layer. Like I mentioned, you can route this in series or in parallel to filter one. Envelope 1 and LFO 1 are routed by default to both filters, and you've got amount controls for each of them. On the desktop version, you don't have dedicated knobs, but like I mentioned before, the parameters are available here in the controls. All right, so I can turn on the LFO for filter 2, do the same for filter 1 if I wanted, which is a little bit hard to hear, I think, with both of these. But you get the idea. Both have key tracking that goes from zero up to 200%, so you could play the filter if you wanted. So, this is the lovely sound we created. Let's move on to the amp module. This is pretty simple. You've got direct routing to LFO2 and Envelope2. Envelope2 is your basic ADSR, right? So what you'd expect from an ADSR envelope, we'll get to envelopes in a bit. You have general level for this craziness, and you also have an ability to tie velocity to the amp as well. So this is a good segue into modulation, the envelopes and LFOs. Hydrosynth has five envelopes and five LFOs. By default, one and two are routed to the filters and amp respectively, like we saw before. Let's take a look at the envelopes. Like I said, simple ADSR, for sure, right, if you want. But you also have a delay stage for each envelope, a stage that happens before the attack, and then a hold stage, which is between the attack and the decay. 
by default, each of the segments is denominated in milliseconds, but if you like, you can sync them to BPM. So then you get BPM ratios, right? Which is, of course, relevant if you sync this to the internal tempo or that of external gear. Aside from that, you also have curve control for each of the segments of the envelope, right? So slopes can be either logarithmic or exponential, and then you can loop the envelope as well. You can choose the number of loops or just have it loop infinitely. And if we right, make these shorter, then this can get pretty fast. Again, we're just modulating the amplitude of the waveform, but of course this can be applied to any parameter you want. One of the things that I really like is that each of the lights here show you right, what state the envelope is in. So let's say I go to envelope two and then bring it up with a long attack. Let's turn off the curve, right? So, right, so you'll notice as I remove the highlight off this envelope that you can see the attack come up in the intensity of the light. Now let's go back here, make it faster. Again, deselect the module, right? You can see the attack, decay, sustain, and release. Let's increase release just for fun, right? And again, look at this as it slowly dies down. So this feedback, I think, is really important both for the LFOs and for the envelopes to understand what's going on. So let's clear this up and move on to the LFOs. So let's take, for example, the LFO, bring it into filter number one, right? And I'll make the rate a bit slower or faster. So waveforms are the typical ones you'd expect. Sine, triangle, saw up, saw down. Maybe if we bring this up, it'll be more noticeable. Square, pulse, all right. A few options there. Sample and hold. You can BPM sync this, of course. And, aside from noise and random, if you like, there's also a step mode. This lets you sequence up to eight square wave style steps to your LFO, which is a pretty interesting feature if you want to set mini sequences for pitch. So if I page down, you can control and have up to eight different steps in your sequence. And then as you go into step edit, right, you can change the level of each of these steps. And if I get out of here and increase the rate, right? So that's my sequence, the step sequence, right? I can edit it if I want. It's a really nice way to create rhythmic sequences. You can make this polyrhythmic by using a few LFOs and choosing a different number of steps each. And if you want to apply this to pitch, then every uh, five steps here is basically a semitone when applied with full modulation to the pitch of the oscillators. The last interesting feature I wanted to talk about here is polyphonic triggering, this little guy here. So by default, any LFO or the sequence will trigger separately for each note I press or for each voice, right? So it can get a bit messy or interesting depending on what you want. If you play multiple notes, but if you wanted, you could just have them sync across all voices. So you could look at this as five LFOs for all eight voices or 40 LFOs five times eight if you want. I think I covered pretty much everything here. Uh, there's also a smoothing option if you like. Right. This applies to all the LFOs, not just the step LFOs. Okay, let's move on and take a look at the effects modules. Hydrosynth has four effects linked in a chain. Pre and post have eight effects each and in between are delay and reverb effects. Now, I don't know about you, but reverb is the first thing I check in a synth that has effects, and this one doesn't disappoint. 
Now, if we just go back to a boring sawtooth, right, let me filter it a bit. So, the nice thing about this reverb, in my opinion, is that it goes all the way to infinity, right, with freeze. If you turn down both high damp and low damp, it will just freeze notes and they will indeed hold on forever. And you can control layering by increasing the high damp and low damp. So, that's the reverb and I can play with this all day, but we don't have all day, so let's turn that down. Let's check out the delays. So a few simple controls here, as you'd expect. Feedback. Right, time. Goes up to three seconds, and down to right, these chorus levels. And there are a few types, basic mono, basic stereo, treats each of the two left and right feeds separately with their own delay. If you have a stereo source, then there's pan delay, stereo style delay, LRC goes left, right, and center, and then reverse is what you'd expect. So that's the reverse delay. The pre-effects and post-effects both have the same type of effects, so we can look at them as one. There's chorus. Right. Depth, dry away control everything you'd expect, flanger, rotary, phaser, lo-fi, this is a downsampling style effect. Then there's tremolo. And EQ, right? Low gain, high gain, crossovers. And finally, there's a compressor. And the nice thing about the compressor is that it has a side chain input. So we can choose anywhere from BPM duck to tap to any one of the mod inputs as a side chain source for this compressor. Rounding out the synth section is voice controls. You've got standard polyphonic modes, but also a mono and unison mode. Let's just turn that on. All right, you've got the voice density control here. All eight voices, more or less. And you've got detune control. Analog feel if you want, adds more variety. 
and a few other interesting settings which we won't go through now. Let's take a look at Hydrosynth's arpeggiator. It's quite feature rich. As I mentioned, the desktop version has four arpeggiator control knobs and the keyboard version has eight, but all the functions are similar and available in the master control section. So if you hit shift edit, you can see what these four knobs control, right? But the other parameters are available as well. So arpeggiator modes are basically what you'd expect. Right, you've got uh, let's just speed this up a bit. Right, you've got up, down, up and down. Right, these modes: order, random, and chord. Phrase goes through a series of phrases, and there are 64 of these in here. Unfortunately, you can't currently program your own phrases, but there are quite a few to play with here. A couple of more interesting things about the arpeggiator. If I go into edit its features, you've got ratchet and chance, where chance is the chance that a ratchet will happen. So that's interesting and neat. Okay, let's start with a clean preset and talk about the mod matrix. Now, Hydrosynth has a mod matrix with 32 slots and you enter it by hitting the mod matrix button. You can page through the slots using the page up and down keys. And then once you want to populate a slot, you just press it, choose the mod source, right? It can be any one of the LFOs after touch, like we saw before, modulation in and out, or MIDI CCs. Then you choose the destination, which can be on a per module basis, any number of parameters, as well as MIDI CCs as mod destinations, right? You can do that as well. And then of course, you can also set mod depth. So that's nice and maybe a little bit complex. Let's just clear this out. But an easier way to assign modulations is just pick the modulation source, one of the LFOs or one of the envelopes, and then hit the modulation destination. So let's say if I wanted to LF LFO four to modulate the cutoff of filter one, I just create the link like that, increase mod depth, and now LFO four modulates the filter cutoff, and I could change its rate, right? Or shape, just like we did before. I can always go back to the mod matrix, change the depth if I want, if it was too much. Right. So that's pretty nice and simple. Let's say that I wanted LFO5 to modulate the rate of LFO4. Just hit LFO5, hit LFO4, boom, another mod, mod matrix slot is populated. And I just go down to rate. Right? Now LFO5. Is modulating the rate of LFO4. So it's super simple to set up routings this way. I think the implementation of the mod matrix in this style is just fantastic. The only thing that I would maybe add or change to it, let's say that I wanted LFO3 to change a parameter in oscillator one, right? So by default, it will change pitch, and then I have to go into here and change the target parameter if I wanted to, right? Move this top knob. I think it would be nice, say, if I was on the reverb page and I just wanted to change, you know, the dry wet level, I could maybe choose an envelope or LFO, right? When I'm in the reverb and then hit the envelope, hit this parameter and have it directly modulate this parameter. That would be even cooler than just going from the envelope to the reverb and then choosing which parameter I want to change the dry wet in this case. Okay, so that is the mod matrix. Let's talk about macros. If you press home, then the eight knobs become macro controls for the preset. 
each macro can control up to eight parameters. And the idea is that there are so many parameters. Once you create a preset and you find out which parameters are the one that you want to perform live, you assign them to a macro. You assign macros using the macro assign button. Pretty simple, you just edit the macro you want to assign. There are, as I mentioned, eight slots per macro. If I wanna assign this one, right? I would just go ahead and choose what I wanna control. Let's say the pitch of oscillator one, choose a depth, right? It could be negative or positive. You can also choose a value for when you press this button. I'll show you that in a bit, right? So now if I go back home, play my sound, then macro one, can control pitch or just set it with this button. There are a few modes for this. This one just blocks this macro knob from changing it and I can unlock it and gain control here again. Now pitch is just one of eight selectable destinations, right? So if I go back to macro assign, go back to edit this guy, I could assign another destination if I wanted and I could also rename this if I wanted. I could choose between the, um, the letters here one by one, right? Or just go to custom names. There's a list here. I could just go ahead and hopefully there's pitch here. Here we go. Yes. So now when I go home, I know that this macro controls pitch. Now they've gone ahead and done this for all the factory presets. So as you explore them, you know, let's just try one randomly. All right, this guy, fifth, All right? So it's very clear what each macro knob does. That's a great way to explore presets this way. So I think we pretty much explored everything. Last two things I wanted to talk about were the CV gate section. If you want to connect Hydrosynth to modular gear, you've got two mod inputs. We saw you can route them to the mod matrix or to the compressor. Two mod outputs, which are destinations in the mod matrix as well. Pitch and gate are monophonic. And then there's clock out. So the last cool feature I wanted to show you is the random function. I've got an empty preset here, All right? The usual. I could choose to randomize an individual module. So just hit random click the module, click again, anything can happen, including zero key tracking, which we don't want. Or I can just randomize everything, the entire patch. Now this can yield unexpected results or interesting ones. This can go to anything from abysmal failure to award-winning patch design. Okay, let's take a look at the pros and cons of the Hydrosynths. On the cons side, the biggest thing that bothered me was the lack of a sequencer. Now, you can get away with some sequencing using the LFOs, but a true polyphonic sequencer would have been really nice here. Now, this is something that could be hopefully added in a firmware update, but there's no word on if and whether that will happen. So if sequencing is important to you, plan on getting a software or hardware companion for Hydrosynth. Another thing which you couldn't have missed throughout this review is that obviously this isn't a knob per function synth. However, I have to say that when you consider that there are 26 modules here and at least four parameters and sometimes multiple pages of parameters for each, this layout is actually a pretty good compromise. This module select layout makes Hydrosynth probably the most logically arranged multifunction synth I've ever seen. So a lot of credit goes to this design. A minor gripe for the desktop version is that the jacks are slightly too recessed inside. I know this is useful when you rack mount it, and it's certainly nice in this frame because the cables aren't sticking out, but if it just sits on your desk, you'll have to flip it up to plug anything into the back and to turn it on and off. Another minor gripe is that there isn't enough contrast difference in the up and down keys when you can scroll another page up or down. And this may cause you, or at least caused me to miss some parameter pages, right? So for example, here I've got three parameter pages. 
Uh, I can't scroll any further down because this isn't lit up brightly, but I can scroll up. It's a little bit hard to notice these. Finally, more of a wish list feature, I guess, than a con. I wish you could assign a different timbre to the ribbon when playing it in theremin mode. How cool would that be to be able to play one sound on the keyboard and another on the ribbon? And if I wanted to get really greedy, sample playback and granular capabilities would obviously be extremely powerful and complementary additions. One can hope, right? So all those cons said on the pros side, the number of synth features and sound power in Hydrosynth, especially at the price that I understand it's going to be sold at, is undeniably attractive. Even if we set aside the fact that polyphonic aftertouch and the ribbon are really cool features, as a synth in its own right, Hydrosynth matches an abundance of parameters with a relatively easy to understand layout, making both the desktop and the keyboard versions extremely compelling instruments and synths. And if you're ever lost with so many features and want ideas on what to do with them, there are plenty of those in my book available to people who support this channel on Patreon. Feel free to ask me any question about these synths in the comment section below, hit like if this was useful, and make sure you hit the notification bell if you don't want to miss the next one. Thanks for watching.